Welcome to Social LO Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God and exposing the devil. Some of you who are waiting on promises from the Lord, you saw the title of this video and you're like, uh oh, I don't think I want to watch this. Now, why in the world would God's promises fail? I mean, He's God. He cannot lie. He's God. And across the Psalm 115 3 and 135 6, He does as He pleases. He's unstoppable. With God, all things is possible. So, why in the world would a promise from the Lord fail? And some of you may have, I'll just say, seen others who said the Lord said something, but it didn't come to pass. And it's like, why would he say something that didn't come to pass? The short answer is, what was claimed as a promise from the Lord actually was not. It was something that he did not make, or it was a promise he made, but he didn't make it to you. You know how, for example, some people misappropriate scriptures and say it's a promise from the Lord, when in some cases it wasn't even the word of the Lord. It was simply something someone said in the Bible, but they claim it as a promise from the Lord. But then there are also certain things where someone went out on a venture, they actually heard from the Lord, but they went outside the Lord's timing. Now, if it is a word from the Lord, the word will come to pass. And that's something, for example, we see in Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, where the Lord asks, how do you know if a word which a prophet has spoken is not of the Lord? And the Lord basically said, if that thing doesn't follow through or come to pass, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. So God's promises, they will come to pass. But if it's a promise he didn't make, he made it to someone else, or he operated outside of his timing, then you will experience failure. And we have to be humble enough to realize that maybe what we thought was from the Lord was not from Him because it didn't come to pass as we perceived, as was stated. Because, for example, some people, they do make proclamations in the name of the Lord, but it wasn't the word of the Lord. And just because we slap the Lord's name, His label on something, doesn't mean it's of Him. And he is only obligated to fulfill those promises that he made. So, for example, things are coming to pass, or as it should have. How in the world did Jacob end up marrying Leah? I mean, the word he had was, after working for seven years, he would be able to marry Rachel. So how in the world did he end up marrying Leah? In that case, his covenant was with Laban. His covenant was not with the Lord. Now there are some shady things going on and he did end up marrying Rachel a week after he married Leah. So like in that case it shows that when the word is coming from a person as opposed to the Lord that people may or in some cases will do shady things. So that clearly wasn't a word from the Lord. We're also going to take a look at how even an enemy can mis misappropriate words from the Lord, but it doesn't mean it's a word from the Lord, and especially to you. After Jesus was baptized, and the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness from be tempted by the devil, in Matthew 4, start verse 5, it states, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. So it's like someone saying, Oh, the Lord said, or the Bible said, or Jeremiah 23 or 29, 11 states, but the Lord have a plan for you, something to take you to an expected end. So he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. I mean, he was quoting scriptures. 
and it was come from Psalm 91. But even in Psalm 91, did the Lord say that he's going to send an angel to his children so that nothing would ever happen to them? And we see how Jesus responded. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So the devil came at Jesus with, from Psalm 91, and Jesus hit him back with Deuteronomy 6.16, 6, about not tempting God. In verse 11, it states, Then the devil leaveth him, and, behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And part of the reason why the Lord had me read that is the devil is a fallen angel. He was speaking to Jesus and even quoting scriptures. Afterwards, holy angels of the Lord came and ministered to Jesus. So there is a difference. So just because something is quoted from the Bible doesn't mean it's a promise to you. And does he mean it was the Lord who said it? It could have been the devil or a minister slash messenger of Satan. In Joel 2, verse 25, the Lord said, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palm worm, my great army which I sent to you. And one of the things with the word of the Lord, it also applies to context. Some people may have gone through things and they'll automatically say that they're claiming Joel 2.25. Well, one of the things we have to look at is, who was the Lord speaking to? Who did he make a promise to? This is not a promise for everyone where you can just, quote unquote, name it and claim it. You may have heard me speak about, I have a Joel 2.25 promise in my life. And you may have heard me say that the way that came about wasn't because I was reading the Bible one day. Now, you can be reading the Bible one day, and the Lord can quicken something in your spirit, and a scripture stands out, and he's making that known to you. But it wasn't like I was reading the Bible one day, and I was like, hmm, that's not good. that sounds like a good scripture. I'll just hold on to it. Especially because I was going through things. For me, I was driving home one day, and there was a grasshopper in the way of my, my garage. And it's like, for some reason, rather than being confident that I just could just keep on driving into my garage, and the grasshopper would just move out of the way, I actually stopped my car in the driveway, walked up to the grasshopper to ensure that it moved out of the way. I've never done it before, and I haven't done it since. But I stopped to move the grasshopper out of the way. The grasshopper actually hopped inside my garage. I'm like, isn't this something? I went inside the garage to move it out. As soon as I walked in the garage, the grasshopper hopped out of the garage and off to the grass safely. As I was turning around to go back to my car to drive it in, the Lord specifically spoke to me, I will restore unto you all the years the locust has eaten. At that point in time, I knew it was based on Joel 2.25. And I can hold on to that promise because it is something the Lord said to me directly. And it is linked to the scripture. So again, it wasn't me just saying, hmm, I like what, how Joel 2.25 sounds, so I'll hold on to it as a promise from the Lord to me. No, the Lord said it, it lines with scriptures, and that is one of his promises in my life. I'll also say that the Lord said that at a time when the locust was eating things from my life. Well, lo and behold, <laughs> the locust kept on eating, I'm like, okay, Lord, but throughout the years, I've been claiming a promise. And there was another incident that happened in my garage. And without going into details, the Lord let me know he was going to send something to actually devour the locust that's been devouring the things he has for me. So again, a promise from the Lord will fail. It's not a promise he made to us. He didn't make it. Or sometimes we operate outside of the Lord's timing. So the Joel 2.25 promise over my life the promise is there, but it hasn't come to pass yet. And we have to not simply know the word of the Lord. We also have to know his, his voice. What is he saying to us? And if, for example, someone is using the Lord's name, that he's actually speaking to and or through that person. 
In John 10, verse 25, it states, Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not the works that I do in my Father's name. They be a witness of me. So his works will be a witness of him. If he said it, he will do it. Also, Revelation 19.10 lets us know that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the truth. A prophecy from the Lord will come to pass because it is the truth. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That says some things. The Lord didn't just say, my sheep hear my words. He said, my sheep hear my voice. The devil was quoting words that seemingly came from the Lord. But it's important to know the Lord's voice. There was a time when Peter rebuked Jesus, when Jesus spoke about going to Jerusalem and getting killed. And may have sounded like a caring disciple for his master. But the Lord said, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me. And that he only had the concerns of men. So Peter spoke, but the Lord heard a voice and knew it was the devil's. So it's very important to not just know the word of the Lord, but his voice when he's saying something directly to you. Because there's some prophecies, for example, some revelations, where you will not hear the Lord said. You will simply hear a message and you have to perceive that it was from the Lord. Case in point, Jonah. When he went to Nineveh, he didn't say, Thus said the Lord, in forty days in Nineveh will be destroyed. He said in 40 days and the city will be destroyed. He didn't use the Lord's name, but people perceived it was from the Lord. And they repented. By the way, that brings up another thing. I wasn't expecting to go there. The Lord had promised to destroy the city in 40 days. One way, another way, a promise from the Lord will fail is if it, there's a call for repentance. The people repented and the Lord stayed his hand of judgment. Now you can say the word failed, but the word eventually came to pass as we see in the book of Nahum, the prophet Nahum, or Nahum, whichever way you want to pronounce it. The word Jonah had spoken came to pass because the Ninevites, they went back into their sinful ways, and the city was leveled. And it continues, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now we can all claim a promise about the Lord saying, no one pluck, basically any of his sheep out of his hand, and also about eternal life. And I pause for a second. I remember July 1st, around July 1st, 2019, I shared a testimony of how, well, it, and it ties in with the restoring all the years of locusts is eaten. I remember one night I was in my office, and the Lord directed me to reach to one of the drawers and pull out a bag of rubber bands. And he had me pulling on rubber bands, and he was showing about how the enemy is trying to pluck me out of his hands, but it will not work. And every time the enemy is trying to pluck me like a rubber band, every time he has to let go, I make a sound. Some of these videos, because the enemy tries things with me, and every time he tried plucking, I would make a sound, but I, the, the enemy could not pluck me out of the Lord's hands. So in addition to the Lord saying it in John 10, he also said it to me directly and gave me the rubber, rubber band analogy that the enemy will not pluck me out of his hand. Now it is my responsibility to hold on to the Lord the same way he's holding on to me. Because there are people, the enemy can't pluck them out, but the enemy try to frustrate them to a point where they walk from the Lord. In John 6, verse 6 and 6, we see how Jesus gave a what they considered a difficult teaching. And many of his disciples walked away from him and followed him no more. But like for me, that John 10, 28, about no one can pluck me out of Father's hand, that is a promise to us. And it's even more potent for me, more poignant for me, because the Lord gave me that rubber band analogy. He made it more personal. So again, we have to be very discerning about trying to hold on to a promise the Lord didn't make or he didn't make to us. And it continues, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. 
I and my Father are one. In fact, I was just reminded, um, shortly before the Lord called me, I was on the 10th floor balcony of a hotel overlooking Miami Beach. And what could be termed a seducing spirit, kind of like how the devil was trying to get Jesus to jump, the enemy was trying to get me to jump and making it seem as if if I jumped, I would land on the ground like a cat. But another word came to mind that rhymes with cat and that is splat, because the enemy was trying to get me to kill myself, but it sounded just like what he did with Jesus. But it wasn't, oh, jump and, and the Lord will have his name. It wasn't about angels. It was about me having the faith to jump and knowing that the Lord would have me land like a cat. I mean, it sounded good for a second, but it was a lie. The enemy was trying to deceive me. So you want the enemy said, it sounded scriptural, but it wasn't of the Lord. And we also have to remember that some words in the Bible, they're from people, and even godly people, but at that time, it wasn't the heart and mind of the Lord. So again, there are some things in the Bible, words, that may be from godly people, but at the time they spoke, it wasn't from the heart and the mind of God. They were communicating on their own unction and not the unction of the Holy Spirit. And not every word in the Bible is divinely inspired. Again, what the devil said to, to Jesus, that wasn't, a, that wasn't God prompting him to say that. That was from his own wicked heart, trying to twist scriptures. And we took an example in Judges 11. In Judges 11, start verse 29, it states, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpeh of Gilead, and Mizpeh of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, I pause. So Jephthah was a godly man. The Lord had raised him up to be a judge. And these words he was saying, they were not inspired by the Lord. Whether well, it's a moment of inspiration or desperation, he said it. The Lord did not tell him to say it. So again, not everything in the Bible is of the Lord. Not everything in the Bible is a promise from the Lord or a promise from the Lord to us. He can point out a scripture and make it a promise to us. Then it becomes a promise. But otherwise, we have to be very discerning about, in a sense, naming and claiming it and saying some things of the Lord. And when it doesn't come to pass, we may start saying, but God said it. It's like, no, he didn't. But God said it. Yes, he did, but he didn't say it to you. So it continues. If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, surely shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Why would he make those that promise? I mentioned about Jacob and Am, Leah and Rachel earlier. In Genesis 28, what we call Jacob's ladder, Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending on the ladder from heaven and the Lord standing at the top of the ladder. After that, he said that if the Lord would bless him and basically bring him back to his father's land, that he would give him a tenth. He did that of his own free will. It wasn't the Lord telling him to give a tenth. Saying that, okay, if the Lord does this and that, then he will give the Lord a tenth. No big deal here. But Jephthah didn't know what was going to come out first. But he's making a statement, and it wasn't of the Lord. And we'll see why. So Jephthah, oh, and by the way, Jephthah didn't have to do this because the Lord raised him up to defeat not just Jephthah's enemy or Israel's enemy, but God's enemies. So he didn't have to make 
this kind of bold statement. But again, these are words in the Bible. But these are words that were not divinely inspired. But these came from the heart of a man. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. Again, the Lord raised up Jephthah as a judge of Israel, an instrument of judgment against not just Israel's, but God's enemies. The Lord is going to deliver them into his hands anyhow. He didn't need to make those promises or that vow. And he smote them from Aurora, even till thou come to Mineth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards. So a tremendous victory. With a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpeh unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Jephthah said something. It wasn't the Lord telling him to sacrifice his daughter. It was Jephthah who said, the first thing that comes out, he will sacrifice. And lo and behold, his daughter ends up coming out. Another example of, for example, of things not coming to pass, because the Lord hadn't spoken it. Something coming from the heart of a person, a person's lips. And even though the person may have been anointed by the Lord, the person wasn't speaking on the Lord's behalf. In 1 Samuel 18, start verse 17, And Saul said to David, I say again, And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Merab, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me, and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So this promised to David for him to marry Saul's daughter, Merab. That was not the Lord saying to Saul, Give Merab your daughter to wife. It was Saul saying, he would give Merab to David. And by the way, he wanted to do so, so she would be a sneer unto him. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be the son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass, at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Maholathite, the Maholathite, to wife. So Saul promised Merab to David, but he ended up giving her to Adriel instead, because that was not a promise from the Lord. Saul, anointed man of God, he said it, but he didn't do it, because that promise was not from the Lord. Another example of people saying things, whether a man or woman of God may even use the Lord's name, making promises. The only way we know if a promise was from the Lord is if it comes to pass or not. In Jeremiah 28, start verse 1, it states, And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azor, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying. Now this is Jeremiah giving this account. Jeremiah the prophet, speaking about Hananiah, saying something in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and the people. 
Now, if he's going to say something, and he's saying the Lord said it, again, in the house of God, in front of the priests, Jeremiah the prophet, who was also a priest, and in front of the people. So if it's a bold proclamation in front of people, it sounds like it's from the Lord, especially when his name is on it. So this is Hananiah saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. So again, think of where he's saying it and to whom he's saying it. And he is using the Lord's name. Within two full years will I bring it again in this place all of the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them into Babylon. I pause. Hananiah said this was going to happen in two full years. I've used the term, if you're marching around the walls of Jericho and you're doing so on day eight and the walls haven't fallen, you want to check to see if you've heard from the Lord. Because if the Lord said, and also ensure that you obey the Lord, because if the Lord said, march around the walls of Jericho once per day, remain silent for six days. On the seventh day, march around seven times. And after that, shout and the walls will fall. If you heard the word of the Lord and you followed the instructions just as he gave them to you and things didn't manifest, then that's letting you know something's out of order. Maybe you thought you heard from the Lord and you didn't. Maybe you missed a step. Maybe the Lord hadn't spoken. So this prophecy Hananiah had two years. Well, the word had two years come to pass, and I'll show if it was from the Lord or not. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So he was saying this was going to happen within two years. But the thing is, Jeremiah told the people, that they're going to be taken into captivity. Jeremiah gave the people the word of the Lord, saying they will be taken into captivity for 70 years, that they should build, they should increase and not decrease. But Hananiah was giving a new revelation. I was going to stop here, but I need to continue a little bit. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah, so we have two prophets here, and it doesn't say false prophet, it said the prophet Hananiah. In the presence of the priests, and in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord. Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied. Thy words which thou hast prophesied. To bring again the vessels of the Lord and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and been before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesied of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. So when what a prophet prophesies come to pass, you know the Lord has sent him. Can a prophet miss it? Yes, for several reasons. But when the word comes to pass, you know the Lord had truly sent him. So Jeremiah was saying, oh, that, that stuff you prophesied, that's great. So Hananiah said two years. Now one of the things about a bona fide prophet of the Lord, if he or she believed that the Lord had spoken with a dream, vision, audible voice, whatever the case may be, and he or she makes a proclamation about something happening, and for example saying within two years it's going to happen, a 
true prophet of the Lord, upon finding out that that word isn't coming to pass or has not come to pass. For example, when confronted, or may even will proactively repent for giving that word. A false prophet will try to maybe say the word didn't come to pass because your faith isn't strong enough. Or the Lord has changed his mind about something. When the Lord speaks, he will act. In Jeremiah 1, the Lord spoke about how he's watching over his words to perform them. That is how seriously the Lord takes his promises. So Jeremiah let everyone know that when the word of the Lord, or when the word the prophet has spoken, then you'll know the Lord has sent him. It also says something else. In Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, 20 through 22 that I spoke of earlier, the Lord mentioned about when he commands a prophet to speak, it is one thing to receive a revelation from the Lord or to perceive that you have. It's another thing to release the message based on the Lord's command. A person can receive a revelation and make assumptions about it and the Lord may have more to say, but he may not say it immediately. And if a person goes ahead of the Lord, that causes trouble. And if they had just waited, the Lord would have re revealed more. In fact, um, with the civil unrest that's taking place in the United States, I think back in 2014, 2015, I heard some prophets prophesy about President Obama trying for a third term and about martial law. Some of the things and about like things around the time of his re-election. The things they say didn't come to pass, but I see things are manifesting now that are linked to those words. And I'm starting to believe that some of those prophets, they saw things, but the way they revealed the message was not in accordance with what the Lord was planning. And they said things in error, but yet what they prophesied, I see those things manifesting today. So we have to be careful about releasing things. And again, we have to be clear, careful about holding on to things. Hananiah said within two years, just imagine if people were holding on to that promise from him for a two year, for a two year breakthrough. And interestingly, even though you could say Jeremiah was kind to Hananiah on the circumstances, let's take a look at what Jeremiah had actually said prior to Hananiah saying this, which is very telling. In Jeremiah 27, starting verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Oh, by the way, in Jeremiah 28, when you have two prophets who cannot agree on, on something, that is a telling sign that it may not be from the Lord. Yet at the same time, you have to test the spirits, you have to weigh things. In 1 Kings 22, there were 400 prophets who said to Ahab that he should go to Ramoth Gilead, that he would be successful. Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord, he said that if he went to Ramoth Gilead, that he would die. And it's like, who are you going to believe? Because more people are saying it? Because one of the things even Ahab said when Jehoshaphat was like, isn't your prophet of the Lord we can inquire of? Ahab said there's Micaiah, the son of Imlah, and said he didn't like him because he doesn't usually prophesy anything good about him. But the thing is, Micaiah had a history of telling the truth. The other prophets were basically yes men. They were saying things the king wanted to hear. Not surprisingly, there were um, King Ahab's wife's prophets, Jezebel's prophets, and continues, Thus say the Lord to me, Make these the bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck, and send them to the king of Edom, and the king of Moab, and the king of the Ammonites, and the king of Tyrus, and the king of Zidon, by the hand of the messengers which came to Jerusalem, unto Zedekiah, king of Judah. And by the way, 
one of the things that made Jeremiah a prophet unto the nations wasn't simply because he went to different countries and prophesied, like giving people personal prophecies. It was because he, the Lord gave him prophecies to speak over those nations. And by the way, it says that Jeremiah sent him the message, the prophecy, via hand of messengers. So like some people speak about YouTube, YouTube prophets or Facebook prophets. Well, Jeremiah sent prophecies via messengers. The messenger or a runner was a, was a medium for the prophet to use. And the Lord can use prophets today on whichever platform he desires, as long as people are getting the message. And command them to say unto their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say unto your masters. So these messengers were going to be delivering pro prophecies, messages, as if they were prophets. But they were not. They were simply mess messengers who were conveying what Jeremiah had received. And I know some people, they will attach themselves to prophets. They will hear what the prophets have to proclaim. Then they'll go on their own platform and proclaim those words as, as if they received it directly from the Lord. If you listen to the wrong voice and proclaim the same message, hmm. I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, but my great power and my outstretched arm, or correction, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. The Lord establishes kings and he takes down kings. And now, have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant? Now, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't building houses of the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, you say he was a pagan king. He worshipped other gods. But the Lord is calling him my servant. Likewise, we have to be careful that because someone doesn't fit a certain mold, that we assume that because a person has come across as being godly, that the Lord isn't using him or her to serve him, the true and living God. So again, and now, have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beast of the field, have I given him also to serve him? And all nations shall serve him, and his son, and his son's son, until the very time of his land come, and then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. And it shall come to pass that the nation and kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword, and with famine, and with the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. By the way, this was during a time of famine in Israel. It was the first time there was a famine in Israel. When you read Psalm 91, you may make it seem as if no pestilence would come near the Lord's children. But yet pestilence had come near them. So there are times when we, we even misappropriate Psalm 91. Because one of the first things speaks about is those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Are you actually dwelling in the secret place of the Most High? And like some promises from the Lord, and there may be real promises from the Lord, they are conditional. For example, your obedience. In Deuteronomy 28, it speaks about if they hearken and obey. If they listen to the word of the Lord and obey it, there'll be blessings, and if they don't, there'll be curses. And it continues, Therefore, hearken not to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, 
nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you to remove you far from your land, and that I should drive you out, and ye should perish. I pause. When you read the entirety of Jeremiah 28, these are exactly the things Hananiah was saying, telling people not to put their necks under the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Hmm. So the Lord already warned the leaders, do not listen to any prophet, whether prophets of the Lord or prophets of the devil. A sorcerer is a prophet of the devil, because a prophet is a spokesperson for a deity, whether it's a prophet of the Lord or a prophet of the devil. It continues, But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell therein. It's important. When you have a word from the Lord, and if someone's coming and trying to give you something contradictory, that you stick to what the Lord said. And the Lord is good about confirming his words. He is not the author of confusion, but of peace. I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and serve him and his people, and live. Why will ye die, thou and thy people, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord hath spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? And there's more. And this is like pointing directly at Hananiah, who would walk through the enemy's snare. And it also speaks of how the Lord at times will tell you something and he'll give you a warning and someone will come and they'll say something contradictory to the word of the Lord and what they're saying is pointing to the Lord telling you before do not listen to anyone who says this do not listen to anyone who contradicts what I have already told you and it continues therefore hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak unto you saying Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. A prophecy that's a lie is not of the Lord. For I have not sent them, saith the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might drive you out, and that ye might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Being a false prophet is dangerous. Also I spake to the priest and to all this people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hearken not unto the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, now, again, Jeremiah 27, it lets us know that Hananiah was prophesying in the house of the Lord, in front of the priests and the people. But here's this warning the Lord had Jeremiah give the priest. So I say, I say again, Also I spake to the priest and to all this people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hearken not to the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house shall now be shortly be brought again from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. And I opened his mouth. And Jeremiah, the Lord already had Jeremiah, warn the people, the priest, not to listen to anyone who said that the things will be back shortly. And two years, it's a short time. Hearken not unto them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Wherefore should this city be laid waste? So the Lord, you're to warn people about prophets like Hananiah and Hananiah himself. Hananiah did things. Now let us see an actual promise from the Lord regarding Hananiah. The Lord is faithful. 
In Jeremiah 28, starting in verse 15, I can say picking up in verse 15, after there was a back and forth between Hananiah and Jeremiah, and I invite you to read Jeremiah 28, the entirety of it. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah, the prophet, so still calling Hananiah prophet, hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust a lie. So if you're trusting a lie, do not expect it to come to pass. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So that was a promise from the Lord to Hananiah, that by the end of the year, he was going to die. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Now mind you, in Jeremiah 28 verse 1, it stated that it was the fifth month. So Hananiah died in the seventh month, which means within two years, the Lord fulfilled his promise to Hananiah and he was a dead man. The Lord is faithful to his promise. This was not marked, but um, this is an unscheduled stop, but a good one nonetheless. In Genesis, in Genesis um, 18, the Lord told Sarah and Abraham that he was going to bless them with a promised child by that time next year. They had been waiting for 24 years for the Lord to fulfill his promise. But now the Lord gave a specific time frame. Hmm. And this is linked to when something has a time frame. If it doesn't happen by then, then it means it was something the Lord hadn't spoken. Time frame. Time frame. So the Lord told Abraham and Sarah that by this time next year, you will have the promised son. That was a promise from the Lord. The Lord watches over his words to complete them. I'll pick up in Genesis 20, verse 3. Now, when you read Genesis 18, the Lord made a promise. Then towards the end, the Lord told Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. So when you see Genesis 19 speaking about Sodom and Gomorrah, it's like, okay. When you go to Genesis 20, you may be expecting to hear about Sarah being pregnant. Well, picking up in Genesis 20, verse 3, we hear, But God came to Abimelech. Oh, by the way, I started at the top. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and, journeyed, and sojourned in Gerar, or Gerar. And Abraham said to, of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. This is a problem. This is within a one-year window where Sarah needs to become pregnant with the promised child. The child who the Lord said was going to be from Abraham's loins that Sarah would bear. So there's a problem here with Abimelech coming into the picture. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. And said to him, the Lord was making a promise to Abimelech, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for thou, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. There's also nothing but the Lord's faithfulness. He didn't allow Abimelech to come near Sarah. There couldn't be any questions of the child's paternity. And he said, Lord, Will thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she even, even she herself said, he is my brother. In integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou, thou didst this in the integrity of thine heart. 
For I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. So the Lord was watching over his promise. And he continued, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know, hmm, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. So Abimelech received a promise from the Lord, return the man's wife, or you and all that belongs to you will die. That's how vigorous the Lord is when he came to watching over his promise. The Lord said that Abraham and Sarah were going to have a child. Oh Lord. The Lord said Abraham and Sarah were going to have a child by this time next year. When the Lord says it, he's going to do it. When he gives a time frame, he's going to fulfill his words. Because the Lord, he doesn't forget. He's not going to forget that he said that by this time next year, something is going to happen. By this time next year, something is going to happen. Something major. The promise you have been waiting for will come to pass at and by the word of the Lord. The Lord is faithful. Abimelech restored the man's wife, and they went on to have the promised child, just as the Lord had prophesied. So no weapon formed against you will prosper. And when people read, no weapon formed against, or say it, no weapon formed against you will prosper, I oftentimes say this, but I say it actually to the Lord. Because if the Lord, for example, made a promise to me, and weapons are coming against me to contest against that promise, they're not contending with me, they're contending with the Lord. Because it was the Lord who said it, it was the Lord who plans on doing it. And when those weapons are coming at me, I'll say to the Lord, no weapon formed against you, the Lord God shall prosper. So we see how the Lord made a promise to Abimelech, and he was going to fulfill it. But the Lord didn't want him to fulfill it like he fulfilled it to um, Hananiah. So Abimelech repented. He returned a man's wife. And the Lord also do things in dreams. We see on 1 Kings 3, the Lord spoke to Solomon in a dream, asked him what he wanted. Solomon asked for wisdom so he could discern and administer justice to the Lord's people. And the Lord said because he didn't ask for the demise of his enemies or for personal riches, that he was going to make him wealthy. And the Lord gave him wisdom and wealth. At the end of 1 Kings 3, we see how two ladies appear before Solomon, contesting over the maternity of a son, an infant son. And Solomon wisely, by commanding one of his men to cut the child in half, discerned that the woman who was willing to let the other woman have the child, rather than have the child die, was the mother of the child. And the other woman wickedly wanted a child cut in half. That is not something someone what you call maternal instincts would do. There was no way of doing DNA testing by then, but the Lord endued Solomon with wisdom from on high to discern who the true mother was. So the Lord, he is faithful to his promises. I've mentioned before that sometimes we operate out of the Lord's timing. So it may have been a legitimate promise from the Lord, but we operate out of his timing. And we end up meeting closed doors. Sometimes we, we may approach a person because there's a promise from the Lord regarding that person. But it's kind of with Abraham and Sarah. The Lord had been speaking with Abraham directly for years about a promised child. And it wasn't until he spoke with Abraham and Sarah about the promised child that was going to come to pass. Sarah knew of the promise, but the Lord had not spoken with her directly. And that's part of the reason why Ishmael was created. But the moment the Lord spoke to Abraham and Sarah, 
he opened a door for the fulfillment of the promise. So some people have gone ahead of the Lord. They knew a person was involved with the fulfillment of the promise, but they didn't wait on the Lord. They presumptuously operated and they approached someone before time and things didn't come to pass because they operated outside of the Lord's timing. And we have to remember, in our concert, Revelation 3 verse 7, the Lord said, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. God is not a liar. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He is the truth. So again, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true. Or if a promise, if a quote unquote promise from, a, from the Lord is leading you into unholiness, there's your sign. He is holy. That is true. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. And he even continues, and this is the Lord speaking, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. So sometimes I hear people saying, oh, the devil stop this, the devil stop that. The devil is not stopping God. There was a point when um, Paul mentioned to the Thessalonians that he wanted to do something, but Satan hindered him. It didn't say the Lord sent Paul, but Satan hindered him. It said Paul wanted to do something, but Satan hindered him. Satan is not going to hinder that which the Lord has appointed. Case in point, Revelation 20.10. Or back up to verse 1, where it states that an angel of the Lord will bind and seal Satan and cast him to a bottomless pit for a thousand years. This is an angel of the Lord. Not the Lord himself, but an angel doing this to the devil. The devil is not going to be able to stop that. Another angel from doing that to him. Then Revelation 20.10, which states that the devil will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil can't stop the promise. That is a promise from the Lord to Satan. It's like back in Genesis 3, where the Lord told the devil that the seed of the woman will trample on his head and he will bruise his heel. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus stepped on the head of that serpent. Yes, he did get strike Jesus' heel, but Jesus gave his life for a purpose. If the prince of this world had known, he would have never crucified Jesus because of the things that happened. So again, the Lord said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So sometimes when say legitimate promise from the Lord, it, it's up to the Lord when he opens the door. If you try going to the door before time, things will not work out the way the Lord intended. You may not be able to get into that door because it's the Lord who has it closed. And you may be thinking, well, the Lord said, this is mine. Well, it's not time. So if Satan is hindering you, it's because it's not time. And speak about, thou hast a little strength. Psalm 105 speaks about how the word of the Lord tried Joseph until the time of his fulfillment. That also speaks, hmm, thank you, Lord. In Genesis 37, the Lord gave Joseph two dreams. And everything that happened after that made it seem as if those words would never come to pass. Those promises from the Lord would never come to pass. His brothers were thinking about killing him. They cast him into a pit. They sold him into slavery. As a slave, Potiphar's wife tried coming on to him. He ended up going into prison. He interpreted the dream for the cupbearer, told him that when the fear restores you, put in a good word for me. The cupbearer forgot about him. So everything made it seem as if those words never come to pass. But because it was the word of the Lord, the Lord brought it to pass. He gave the fear two dreams that no one could interpret. He shut those things down. So he closed the doors on any other person from being able to interpret those dreams except for Joseph. 
The Lord opens doors, no one can shut, and he shuts doors, no one can open. It says what, and has not denied my name. Stay faithful to the Lord. Stay faithful to the Lord. If he has made a promise to you, and in due time, he will bring it to pass. With the Lord opening doors, one thing with Moses, he didn't want to go unless the Lord was going to go with him. David, David had his way where he wanted to ensure the Lord was with him. He oftentimes consulted with the Lord, especially before making major decisions, to get the wise counsel of the Lord. Joshua was one who learned from Moses regarding, for example, even the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, to stay behind that pillar. The angel of the Lord was going ahead of them to clear the way. And Joshua 23, which is how I think I will end this teaching, speaks about the faithfulness of the Lord. And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given Israel, had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. So they had to do a lot of fighting. A lot of people, and I, I'm going to give another teaching about how people idolize the promised land. But for the Israelites, the promised land was a place that they fought many battles. But as they came to the promise, the Lord gave them rest. When the Lord brings you to the promise, promise He will give you rest. You may have to clear some things out, but He will give you rest. And Joshua called for all Israel and their elders, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age, and ye have seen all the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought, fought for you. The Lord will fight to fulfill his promises to you. He will clear the obstacles. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. It also speaks about how the Lord, he may make a promise to you, but the fulfillment of the promise may be incremental and it may seem as if the promise has failed. With David, the Lord and had Samuel anoint him as Israel's future king. But David was actually king over Hebron at Judah for seven years. During that seven year reign, Saul's son Ishbosheth was ruling over Israel. But after seven years, Ishbosheth was assassinated. Not by David's conspiration, but some two men assassinated Ishbosheth. David become, became king over Israel at the behest of the people. And scripture tells us that David perceived that the Lord had made him king. David, Saul spent years persecuting David, trying to kill him. David ended up in the hands of the Philistines. He lived among them. He had some peace. Saul ended up dying in battle. David ended up being king over Hebron first. And seven years later, Israel. Some promises of the Lord, the fulfillment is incremental. So also I had to be mindful of that. So and Joshua continued, and the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you, and drive them out from out of your sight, and ye shall possess their land, as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. So because he has promised it, that is why it's going to come to pass. But ye therefore, be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye return not aside, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. In Revelation 21, 8, 
It speaks about those who be cast into lake of fire and brimstone. The first stated are those who are fearful. Above the abominable, above the sorcerers, the first, they are stated are fearful. So if you receive a promise from the Lord, be strong and of good courage, because that could cause delays. That ye come not among these nations, these remain among you. Neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. But cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven them driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. It was time for the fulfillment, fulfillment of the promises, and the Lord was driving people out, one way or another, to fulfill his promises. So if the Lord promised you something that someone or others is holding on to, in Abimelech's case, either hand it over or die. In the Israelite's case, he was going to drive them out, the Lord's going to drive them out one way or another, either by death or they're going to flee for their lives. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God, he it is that frighteneth for you, as he hath promised you. So the word promise being used again. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, that ye love the Lord your God. Don't lose your love for the Lord. Don't allow your love for him to wax cold. Else, if ye do in any wise, go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain strong among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they unto you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. When the Lord makes a promise to you, any conditions that he puts on those promises, ensure that you're doing your part, or you will see the promise of the Lord fail, not because he failed, but because you failed. So if the Lord makes a promise to you and he gives you conditions for things you need to do, ensure you do those things. So back up. Know for certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorn in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given unto you. So follow what the Lord instructed you to do. Follow what the Lord instructed you to be. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. See, I could have only read verse 14, but I need to read the entire thing. Hmm. And I continue. Therefore, it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so all things that the Lord promised, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, do not transgress your covenant with the Lord which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them. Then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. But well, I conclude this section 
about why promises from the Lord, why they fail. He didn't say it. He said it, but it wasn't a promise to you. It was a promise to you, but you went ahead of the Lord and you ran it through basically a brick wall. He's the one who opens doors that no one can shut. But when he makes a promise, just like with the Israelites, I read verse 14 of Joshua 23 again. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. So it's a promise from the Lord, it will come to pass. If it didn't, check to ensure that it was God who made it, and that you didn't violate any of the conditions for those promises. Or maybe he made it, but he didn't make it to you. Many people misappropriate scriptures in the name it and claim it type doctrine. Or maybe he made a promise to you, but you went to the Lord and it seemed like it failed, but it wasn't time, which means there's still time. When the Lord says, he does. When the Lord says, he does. And um, like he told Jeremiah, that he's watching over his words to perform them. Joshua spoke about all the things the Lord promised about them coming to pass. Likewise, the Lord's promises will come to pass in your life. Just don't end up like Hananiah. Peripherally, it would be like Abimelech if you are in error, where the Lord tells you something that you can repent. What the Lord says, He does. If it didn't happen, may I pray this will help you to check why it didn't happen. Just maybe the Lord didn't speak, or he spoke where he didn't speak to you. God bless you. Jesus is Lord.